welcome to everybody. Also a special welcome to our, our guests. I can say that everybody's uh, very happy to, to have you here. Um, you can hopefully see the, um, the topic that I'm going to present on. It's staring you right in the face, investment treaty arbitration after Ahmia. Um, perhaps if, if you are new, you, you won't understand the concept of investment treaty arbitration. You will probably not understand the concept of Ahmia, but within about five minutes, I absolutely promise that you will. And I can also promise you it will be quite exciting because as you'll see, Ahmir was like a volcano in the area of investment treaty arbitration. So I want to, to, to give you that to, to give you that inspiration to, to stay on and think, well, what is going on here? It, it literally it blew up an entire area of law. Um, like any volcano, there were a lot of consequences of the Ahmia decision. I cannot go through all of them. I will concentrate on three big ones. Um, before I get to these questions, however, and you can see that investment treaty arbitration is shaking because of the volcano now, um, we'll do a bit of background. I've said first, I'm going to introduce you to what investment treaty arbitration is. And fortunately, it's very simple. Um, the basics are this. One, you have an investment treaty. Two, you have a state. I know many of you are, are from Russia. There are also some Chinese here today, some Chinese students and professors. You can imagine that state A is Russia or, or China. That state A makes promises of good treatment of investments made by state B investors in its territory. So if we imagine that state B is Germany, essentially China or Russia promises good treatment of German investors. The important thing is, and this is what's really something you need to understand, if state A, i.e. China or Russia, allegedly breaks its promise of good treatment, then a state B investor, namely a German investor, can sue state A in arbitration. And that is what we call investment treaty arbitration. And oops, uh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way there. Let me just, and state B, which would be Germany in our example, um, it makes the same promise. So it promises good treatment of investments made by state A's investors in its territory and of course, it says, if me, state B, allegedly breaks the promise of good treatment, we can go to arbitration. That is what we call investment treaty arbitration, the possibility for a foreign investor to sue a state in arbitration. What about Ahmir? Ahmir was a case before the um, European Court of Justice. Um, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details of this case. Um, it came out in 2018, which means that there are a lot of summaries online that you can read about if you want to get into some more detail. I want to go straight to the main issue, which is this. Are IDS clauses in investment treaties between two member states this is what we call intra-EU investment treaty arbitration. Please remember that concept, intra-EU investment treaty arbitration, compatible with EU law. Now, if you don't quite understand the issue, just think back to the explanation of investment treaty arbitration. Uh, remember, one state promises to go to arbitration with an investor if an investor thinks it's not treating my investment as it, as it should. So what this issue essentially asks, and you'll have to excuse the fact that there are some ambulances outside, it's one of the joys of, of working here, but they'll be passed soon. What the issue really asks is, can an investor from one member state of the European Union sue another member state in arbitration for that member state's lack of good treatment of its investment. So that's really what the Ahmia decision is all about. It's asking, is intra-EU investment treaty arbitration possible under European law? Now, the answer is no. I'm not going to go through the legal reasoning as to how they got there. Um, I'll get down to the, the, the kind of concluding 
um, concluding paragraph of the decision. And the European Court of Justice wrote this, Articles 267 and 344 on the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union must be interpreted as precluding such clauses. So, I mean, we know that they're not compatible under European law. These ISDS clauses in investment treaties, they are a no-go under European law. But what does that mean very practically? Um, there are, I, I tended to think, this is one of those cases that raises more questions than, than what it actually answers. One of the first ones is, and we're going to go through these answers uh, soon enough, but let me go through them first. What did the decision mean for arbitral tribunals of intra-EU investment treaty arbitration? They might be having these arbitrations off to the side. The European Court of Justice says these arbitrations are incompatible with European law. Where does that leave those people on arbitral tribunals over here? Second issue, did the decision extend to the Energy Charter Treaty? Um, to understand this question, you need to know what the Energy Charter Treaty is. And the Energy Charter Treaty is a multilateral investment tr treaty between some member states, but also some third states, okay? Some member states are in it and some third states. Now, technically, the Ahmed decision only applies to investment treaties between two member states. So it was a bit of a question, well, does it apply to multilateral investment treaties? And finally, we're going to look at what was the legal status of arbitral awards coming from in intra-EU investment treaty arbitration. So arbitral awards are like the judgments. So if, as it turned out, this idea of intra-EU investment treaty arbitration was not compatible with EU law, then what about all of those judgments or arbitral awards that had been written? Were they invalid now? All right, let's get in to the first question. What did the Ahmed decision legally mean for ongoing or future intra-EU investment treaty arbitrations? Well, um, it really depends who you ask, which I suppose is um, pretty much the standard reply to any legal question. If you ask the arbitral tribunals, they said it meant absolutely nothing for us. Achmia doesn't mean a thing. You might be thinking, well, why is that the case? And I think that uh, you know, a good illustration of the way arbitral tribunals were thinking comes from this case here. Ahmed Kodopoulos, I'm sure that I'm going to get a better pronunciation from one of our Greek speakers soon, versus Cyprus. It's a long quote to read, but fortunately, I'm going to focus your eyes on exactly where you need to be. You'll see there's some highlighted text there. Thus, this tribunal has to decide whether as a matter of international law, you probably don't even have to read past that point. But what the arbitral tribunal is saying is this. We need to decide the question whether we can continue this arbitration under the rules of international law. What European law says is a completely separate issue and we are not worried about that. We are going to look at international law. The EU treaties might be part of that international law and then we need to consider them in, in, in that context. But the ground rule is we will apply international law to decide whether we can have intra-EU investment treaty arbitrations. And um, perhaps no surprise, um, all arbitral tribunals have decided under international law, they still have jurisdiction. They can still keep these intra-EU investment arbitrations rolling. What about the European Commission and the member states? Well, as you might imagine, uh, they had a, a different opinion on this. They said no jurisdiction. So what that basically means is they are saying to all these arbitral tribunals, listen, we say to you that because of the Ahmia decision, you are no longer legally permitted to continue intra-EU investment treaty arbitrations or 
if an investor tries to start one in the future, you always have to say, no, 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 we do not have jurisdiction. Um, about nine months after the decision came out, um, the European Commission and some member states, um, some of them decided not to participate in this process. Uh, from memory, Austria, Finland, um, Austria, Finland, Sweden, and Ireland. These are the four countries that said no, but most member states are on board. And if you bring your eyes down towards the end of this little um, extract here, you'll see it says, an arbitral tribunal established on the basis of investor state arbitration clauses lacks jurisdiction due to a lack of a valid offer to arbitrate by the member state party to the underlying bilateral investment treaty. So that's the position of the European Commission and most of the member states. So you've got a bit of a fight going on here between arbitral tribunals and on the other hand, the commission who eventually won. Well, I'm going to show you here. The final outcome was this agreement here, an agreement for the termination of bilateral investment treaties between the member states of the European Union. And I think the most uh, important provision for our purposes is Article 4 here. And it, it basically says, I think, I think the last line is the most important one, so let me highlight it. The arbitration clause in such a bilateral investment treaty between two member states cannot serve as, I would say, a legal basis for arbitration proceedings. I think there's a little bit of an error there, but we don't need to worry about that. Um, what the member states are doing here, there's only 22 of them, however, sorry, 23. What the member states are, are doing here is coming together and they are terminating all of their bilateral investment treaties and writing down some rules in the process, including some that are directed towards arbitral tribunals to say no more intra-EU investment treaty arbitrations. The thing is, you'll see this only applies to bilateral investment treaties. So what about multilateral investment treaties? Specifically, this one, here, the Energy Charter Treaty. Does the Ahmed decision extend to the Energy Charter Treaty? Before I get into the, the nuts and bolts of this, it's important to understand the significance of this question. And, and the significance lies in the fact that the Energy Charter Treaty is the most important treaty in the area of international investment law. About nine to 10% of all investment treaty arbitrations, and there's been about a thousand of them, there's even definitely a bit more now, um, but about nine to 10% of, of all of them are intra-EU arbitrations under the Energy Charter Treaty. So what is going on with this treaty? It, it really, really matters. Again, the answer to this question will depend on who we ask. No surprises if you ask arbitral tribunals, they just say, no, the Ahmed decision does not extend to the Energy Charter Treaty and they give the same reasons that I went through a little bit earlier. They say our jurisdiction is a matter for international law and when we apply international law, somehow that application tells us we have jurisdiction, we can continue. What about legal scholars? They've had a lot of fun with this question. Generally, they've come to the answer no. Of course, that means there are some exceptions out there. What about the European Commission? Well, as you would expect, it says, yes, definitely. The Ahmed decision does extend to the Energy Charter Treaty. Member states, again, you have a situation where you have most saying yes, some saying no, and you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, why is it the case that you have some member states saying yes, sorry, most member states saying yes, but, but some saying no? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that some member states have um, quite an interest in seeing that their investors can still use the Energy Charter Treaty to sue 
other states. And a very good example of this is a recent decision that Germany has been involved with, with, with Vattenfall. Vattenfall is an energy company. And if, if, if you're big on your, if you know your, your energy company very well, you'll know that Vattenfall is a state-owned Swedish company. It has been suing Germany. And of course, well, Sweden thinks, gosh, we don't want this Achmea decision to, to apply to the Energy Charter Treaty because then that compromises our, our case against Germany. So that's why um, some states have said, wait a minute, we're not sure about how far the uh, Achmea decision really goes. But I think the most important institution to answer this question is the European Court of Justice. Back in September, September 2001, quite recently, they had to look at, well, they didn't actually have to look at this question, but they decided to go off on a tangent and, and looked at this question. Um, but the case is Moldova versus Comstroy, and they came down with the answer of yes, the Achmea decision does extend to the Energy Charter Treaty. So what does that mean now? I, it, of course, it means a lot of things, but I expect that as states are revising the Energy Charter Treaty, um, we should now expect member states to say, we are going to create a new clause in this new Energy Charter Treaty, and it says that investors from one member state cannot sue another member state basically what we saw with this agreement to terminate the BITs between member states, but only in the Energy Charter Treaty. All right, then let's move on to question three. Um, and I promise this will be the end of it. And then we can get into the conversation. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to make. What about the legal status of arbitral awards that have come from intra-EU investment treaty arbitration? So until 2018, there was a question whether intra-EU investment treaty arbitration was compatible with European law. The, the assumption was that it, it, it actually was compatible and the, the Achmea decision um, not, only, not only overturned that, but it was a, a big surprise that the, that, the, that the court actually said, no, it's, it's, it's not compatible. So there's a whole lot of investment, intra-EU investment treaty arbitrations that have finished. Arbitral awards slash judgments have been handed down. What is the legal status of these arbitral awards? We're going to call these pre achmia arbitral awards and they are valid, okay? So if you're thinking, well, okay, put this in context for me. Imagine that you are a state and this, well, you as the state, you have already paid compensation to an investor under a pre achmia arbitral award. You might be thinking, great, now I can get that money back because as it turned out, that arbitration was not compatible with European law. We now know because of the treaty that I spoke about earlier, the agreement to terminate the bilateral investment treaties between member states. No, that cannot happen. These arbitral awards are valid. However, I think the important point here is the definition of a pre achmia arbitral award. It only includes paid up arbitral awards, okay? So only arbitral awards that the state has paid the money and that's the end of it. If the money is still outstanding, it's not a pre achmia arbitral award. It is a post achmia arbitral award. And post achmia arbitral awards includes all arbitral awards in the future. There might not be any, but if there were, that they would be post achmia And it also includes all the arbitral awards that come from intra-EU investment treaty arbitrations that were ongoing at the time that the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, handed down its decision in Achmia. So what's the legal status of these particular arbitral awards? And the only thing I could come up with was complicated. That's not the end of my answer, but I'm just going to forewarn you here that um, this, this is one of the more interesting, difficult, but, but interesting questions. So post Achmia arbitral awards. Let's think about them. If you are in the European Union and you want to try to enforce a post-Achmia arbitral award, then good luck. 
because they are invalid. Um, and again, the explanation comes from this agreement for the termination of bilateral investment treaties between the member states. I think Article 7 is the most important uh, provision. I've used the highlighter there just to, to highlight the most important words. Well, I think what, what are the most important words? And it basically says that contracting parties, the member states, um, have to go and tell national courts including in a third country, and we'll get to third country soon, as the case may be, to set aside the arbitral award, to annul it, or to refrain from recognizing and enforcing it because they have agreed now that these arbitral awards are invalid. All right, then. That leaves the, the, the question of what about third countries? What happens if we go outside the European Union? And this is where I think it gets very interesting. They are potentially valid. We have seen recent enforcement proceedings in Australia and the United States. And not too long ago, a couple of months ago, an Australian court, the Federal Court of Australia, they're actually the full court of the Federal Court of Australia. So it's just one level below the, the top court in the Australian court hierarchy in the Kingdom of Spain versus Infrastructure Services Luxembourg. Um, of course, I've cut out most of the judgment, but I've put the most important part for us down there. The court orders that judgment be entered in favour of the applicants, that is, the investor in this case, against the respondent for the pecuniary obligations under the award in the sum of 101 million euros as compensation for Spain's breach of the Energy Charter Treaty. Let me emphasize the date of the judgment there. 25 June 2001, I followed this case very carefully because I, um, I know very well a colleague of mine who works as a professor at the University of Sydney was acting as counsel for the investor in this case here. And what really surprised me a couple of weeks later was this. European Commission press release state aid. Commission opens in-depth investigation into arbitral award in favour of Anton. Anton is the is the applicant in the Australian case that we spoke both, I'm sorry, that we just spoke about. Um, the, the press release basically says, yes, the European Commission is going to start an in-depth investigation. What I think is quite interesting is that it only took them four weeks to start the in-depth investigation. So as soon as the Australian court says to Spain, we are going to enforce this arbitral award against you, against Spanish assets in Australia. I didn't know that they had that many, but apparently they, they do. A couple of weeks later, the European, sorry, the European Commission says, we are going to look at whether paying this arbitral award by Spain could constitute a breach of the state aid rules in the European Union, which, you know, I think that the simple way to, to understand this is that the European Commission has kind of pulled out its, its, its big weapon against the investor here. And it said to the investor this, if you keep going through with this enforcement process, we'll probably consider it to be state aid. They actually say down the bottom here, at this stage, the Commission's preliminary view is that the arbitral award wouldn't constitute state aid. If you pay state, if you take state aid as the investor, we will make sure that Spain has to take an action against you to get it back. So eventually all of your enforcement proceedings in Australia, for example, we want to make sure that they come to zero because either way, we are going to somehow ensure that you do not get the money, which seems like, okay, the European Commission has won again. And perhaps that might be the case, but it gets, it gets better here. I think it's been wonderful already, but it gets even better. Could, and I'm, this is my last question here, could we launch a claim then against the European Union? The European Union is a, um, is a signatory to the Energy Charter Treaty. So there is the possibility for an investor to sue the European Union under the Energy Charter Treaty. Could we say to the European Union by the act of 
taking away the investor's compensation, is that act a breach of the energy charter treaty? Could we launch another claim against the European Union? Um, I want to leave you with that. I think I've probably gone over my time, so I stop there and I thank you very much for your attention.